Hey everybody, Tom here. Welcome to Patterns and Profits, my podcast. This is for week ending August 9th. It's been a few weeks podcasting with you. Um, 26, July 26th. That was the last time I, I had a podcast. I was um, sitting here before I hit the record button. And I'm thinking, what am I going to talk about today? What am I not going to talk about? <laughs> God, you know, I mean, the last time I was on, um, you know, the, the, the Democrats had, had uh, just ushered out Joe Biden and they ushered in Kamala Harris uh, as the candidate for 2024. And anyway, a, a lot's happened since then. I mean, I could talk political. I could talk geo uh, politics. I could talk um, uncertainty. I could talk trends. I could talk, uh, gosh, I mean, there's so many different areas we could go into. But let me just say this. I think what I want to do is, you know, I was, I was looking at uh, the and listening to the July 26 podcast. So I'm going to recap a little bit of that and kind of play this. How did it go? Where are we are? You know, anything? Am I doing anything and changing um, my stance as a, as a trader going forward? So um, last month, it was only a couple weeks ago, last month, I said that we turned to bear market territory for the first time in a while. I said that the week of July 26th. In fact, I started getting a lot of bearish opportunities that were pocket, popping up starting July 29th. Okay, that was the following Monday. And then, of course, if you've seen what's happened to the markets, you're like, wow, how'd this guy do that? I mean, look at August 1st. And you can see, for instance, um, the markets had a huge move down August 1st, gap down the following day, gap down the day after that. We've had a little bit of, uh, uh, of rise since then, but we're talking about, folks, we're talking about August 1st, August 2nd, and then Monday. You know, Monday, like the 5th, that was the that was really the washout day for now. The washout day for now. So markets kind of started the week, I and mean, we really ended last week, but started the week as one of the worst in years. So if you are like me and you're you you think as an extended hours guy. You know, you're not the 930 to 4. And by the way, if you trade cryptocurrency, then you're not the 930 to 4. You're looking at this stuff at night. You're looking at it on the holidays. You're looking at it on weekends. I mean, truly the, the most efficient market out there. And it's not even fully legitimized yet. What I mean by that, it hasn't been accepted by everyone. Yeah, give it time. It will. But uh, you know, if you want to get an idea where the markets are going to open now on Monday, just watch, just look at Bitcoin over the weekend because Bitcoin does to some degree follow the assets of the world. All right. So again, we started out the week one of the worst in years. I mean, if you, if you were up Sunday night, if you were up early Monday morning and you saw the Japanese stock market, it literally dropped like a, with a thud, double digit loss. It was off 13% coming into Monday morning. And, you know, you saw, I saw the NASDAQ down 6.5% pre market trading on Monday. I'm like, what is going on? Um, now, I didn't have time to deal with what was happening in the markets. And honestly, I didn't care. I mean, you know, that's, that's one big thing I've learned in my decades in this business is that you don't put yourself in a situation to care. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more on this podcast. Why don't I care? A couple reasons. But um, I'll tell you why I didn't care on Monday. Because I had a tropical storm that was knocking on the front door. I had, I, I live in Sarasota, Bradenton. Okay. For any of you that, you know, want to know the geography. And, um, the, the tropical storm, Debbie, came rolling in. And, you know, it didn't look like it was going to be a big deal. In fact, I got very little wind at all. 
if there was any wind that was happening, I didn't hear it. it I didn't hear it Sunday night. And, and I didn't see it Monday. But you know what I saw a lot of? Rain. And not only did we get a lot of rain, but our neighboring counties got a lot of rain. The counties that were higher up. I know most of you think Florida is a flat state. All right. There's parts of Florida that are, that are not flat. And those are the parts where the water runs off and it hits us. And so we got hit so hard Monday morning that they had to release water from the local dam. Otherwise, the dam was going to break. And so I woke up Monday, and other than the rain, you know, um, my I had waterfront property all pretty much all the way around the house. And I'm on 10 acres, folks. So we're talking about acres and acres of now waterfront property. The driveway was waterfront property. The road leading to my house, waterfront property. The road, the, the, the main road that takes us in and out of town was closed. Never saw anything like this. Never saw anything like this in my, oh gosh, 17 plus years I've been living in the state of Florida. And we went through a hurricane, a, a four and a five in those years. Never saw anything like this. I mean, when they showed it on the Weather Channel, and they show the different colors, and the colors de designate how much rain you're getting. Our area was white, and white was 12 to 18 inches. So I can tell you, without a doubt, that I could care less what was going on with the markets on Monday, because I had something bigger happening. Anyway, and I'll tell you why I don't really care that much to begin with. Um, it has something to do with a little thing called money management. But Here's the thing. Um, Japanese stock market off 13%. This is lows that we haven't seen since 1987. That's how bad it was overseas. I mean, it kind of makes you think, wow, you know, the U.S., you know, we, we, we opened really hard down, but then we get a, got a bit of it back. Yeah, Dow was down 1,000 points, but look what's happened since then. We are back to the, we came back to the Friday close. We filled that gap. You know what else I think about when I think about 1987? That rings a bell. That was the second year I was actually trading. The second. My first was 1986. I was 21 then. Oh, those days. 1986. I had a compact 386 computer. This thing was as thick as like a big phone book and probably weighed twice as much. Um, boy, they made stuff good back then. I bet if I still had that laptop, it'd still be working. It would take a, it would take a couple hours to boot up, but I bet it was still working. Um, yeah, Compaq 86. I had a DOS version of Metastock. So that's what I was using. That was my charting service back in the 80s. Metastock. DOS. Remember disk operating systems? And yeah, it was a disk. It was a three and a half. They called it a floppy, but it wasn't a floppy. Uh, they didn't have anything better to call it. Three and a half disk. That's what we stored stuff on back then. You know, <laughs> bread, water, floppy. Um, Investors Daily. It was called Investors Daily before it was called Investors Business Daily. Uh, these are things I remember. I remember stock market crash. I remember losing everything that year and even some stuff I didn't own. How do you go negative? I'll tell you how you go negative. You basically, here's, here's the key to losing all your money real quick. Number one, you have very little education. Okay. Number two, you think you know everything, but you know nothing. And number three, you listen to the person with the biggest mouth that has absolutely no skin in the game. And you invest all of your money and over leverage on the single worst day of the market's history. And that was October 19th, 1987. That's, that's how I did it. Margin call I couldn't meet. I had to take a year off. My broker called me probably weekly. Where's our money? Because I owed the broker money. 
I went below zero. I can walk down the street, see a homeless guy on the corner with a cup wanting some change. And I'm going to look at him and I'm thinking, that guy has a better net worth than me. Because he did. So, yeah, um, I had to claw my way back. That was 1988. I had to claw my way back. Um, you know, I had a debacle like that in the real estate market uh, way back in the day, too. Two different industries. What did I learn about both? Well, you need to know more than most people. That means you got to get some knowledge. You got to get some knowledge about what it is you're doing. It's just like a skill set at work. You can't be an electrician if you don't know anything about wiring. You can't be a plumber if you have no idea how plumbing actually works. If you don't know the fundamentals of, of, of electricity or how water works, how in the world can you be an electrician or a plumber? You have to have knowledge. You have to have specified knowledge. I didn't have specified knowledge in the markets back then. I knew enough to be dangerous. And you know what else I didn't know? I didn't understand leverage. I understood leverage to, hey, here's two to one leverage in the market. Your, your dollar works twice as hard for you. And then in the commodities markets, let me tell you, I was trading commodities back in the day too. I was getting 20 to one leverage. My, my dollar was working 20 times. What I didn't realize is that it worked 20 times against you. And in the stock market, margining, all right? two times against me. Anyway, that's how I ended up losing everything. Not knowing anything, thinking I knew everything, over leveraging in the most volatile time in my lifetime. I don't want you to do that. All right, back to the markets. So um, think about this, folks. I want you to think about the S&P was at a low in January. It hit a high in July. We had a hiccup in April. Remember that? A April had a pullback. Right. April did have a, a, a pretty healthy pullback. It pulled back about 33% of the gains that it made in January. Okay, think about that. For, from, from the first three weeks of April, we had a 33% pullback, not in the overall markets, just in the move that went up. We gave thir a third of that back in three weeks. Okay, then we start moving along. The rest of April looked good, May looked good, June was fantastic. And July, the first couple weeks of July, things did really good. Then we turned. A lot of people don't realize that we hit all-time highs in the S&P 500, not at the end of July, but in the middle of July. The pullback that we saw that, that came into this week, well, that gave away 55% of the gains that we had since January 1st. Okay? Yeah, most people will say, oh, yeah, the stock market went down 10%. You know, when you go from 565 down to 510, that's 55 points off. All right, 55 points off something that's at 560. Okay, we'll call it a nine, 8 or 9% pullback. Yes, that is correct. For those of you that are mathematicians, yes, the market lost 8% of its value. But I'm telling you, that it lost 55% of its gains for the year during the weeks from the middle of July to the beginning of this week. Okay, so, you know, it we're getting some buyers that are coming in. Yes, there's, there's a calming effect that's happening. The VIX, the VIX was a teenager. It wasn't even a teenager last month. It was 12. It grew up to 80 before Monday morning. And now it's back down in the 20s, still kind of high. But it made its big move. It had the biggest move in, uh, since COVID. That's how big the VIX got. The, big, the VIX hasn't been this high since 2020. And it dropped. It's, it's, it's calming down. But are we going back to all-time highs again? Are we going back to uh, – the, the only reset I see is maybe this weekend. And then – you know, everybody's going to start to think about what happened. And there's going to be a lot of folks that say, wow, it's been a good run. Maybe I need to take some money off the table. So, you know, you look at where we are, you know, coming into Thursday, Friday, 530 on the S&P. That's going to be a good resistance number. And 
we're going to have trouble getting over that 530, 535 area because resistance became support and now support is becoming resistance again. So this is a, an area where everyone's going to really kind of think over the weekend. And I'm going to tell you, you want to know where the market's going to be on Monday? One good place to go is the cryptocurrency markets. Look at Bitcoin, look at Ethereum, and they're going to give you some kind of a gauge. It's not perfect. It's not 100% because, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin is a driver. And we're, we're driving on roughly 400 coins. You know, I mean, you look at you look at what's out there right now that's being tossed around. There's 21 million coins that are going to be in total uh, that are going to be totally out there. What have we mined like 20 million of them so far over 20 million? And of those, most are hodled right now. Um what is it MicroStrategy uh, has uh what uh, I'm thinking 200,000 of these coins. Michael Saylor, I believe himself, he owns 17,000 personally. I own a few. <laughs> Um, BlackRock has 200,000. What I'm saying is, is that most of the coins that have been mined are held. They're being held. So Bitcoin's moving around based on a couple hundred coins on the bid and offer. So someone could come in and buy a couple hundred coins and it's going to push it up or down. But if we're not pushing it up or down, it does move around like the asset every once in a while. So Keep an eye on it over the weekend if you want to see where possibly we could be coming into Monday morning. Otherwise, you got to look at, uh, you got to watch Bloomberg on Sunday night. Um, oil, nothing surprising here. Oil's trading at the, it was trading off the low end of its range this week. We saw that. We've seen, uh, and, and it shouldn't be a surprise because I've been talking about this, that oil is coming off of its luster. The only thing that's going to push oil up now in this case, is if we swing back to uh, where we believe that the Republicans and the drill baby drill are gonna gonna be in office in November. But right now, it's a, it's a tight race. I mean, last month, you know, when I talked to you in July, it looked like Donald Trump just had to keep his mouth shut, and and he was gonna be a shoe in. Now it doesn't look that way anymore. Okay. Doesn't look that way anymore. But I also believe that we're seeing numbers that we're being led to believe, whether you're on the right side or the left side. I believe that we have to see a debate and we have to see both of these candidates without teleprompters. And I believe that will help tilt the scales one way or the other. Okay. So. Anyway, I got off topic. Oil, seasonally low. Um, what's the other thing that could make oil spike? We get any more uncertainty going on in the Middle East or possibly even in China, that could push the price of oil higher. Gold. Gold's been moving sideways this week, um, but I got to say, I mean, are you as surprised as I am that when you look at GLD that um, it's still up there? It's still up there, folks. I mean, if you haven't looked at GLD, it's still in an uptrend. Yeah, it was at 220, uh, what, 227 last week. It dropped down to around 220, but it held that 220 really well. And here we are. We're back in the mid 220s again. I mean, all time highs are really, what, a couple percentage points away. It's still. Still holding up really well. And I think that, I mean, the gold bugs are happy. The folks that have been saying um, crypto is the new gold, well, I mean, you know, they're, 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 I'm not going to say the wrong, but everyone thought gold was going to be a washout. A lot of the crypto bugs thought gold was going to be a washout. And so far it's not because it is really, it is the old world uncertainty. It is the old world safety. And it there's going to be um, this, this security of having something in your hand or the security of having something that you know in your account that is going to hold up, especially in with the uncertainty we have right now um, overseas, with the uncertainty we have right now with the markets and inflation. 
um, you know, if if the Fed cuts rates, it's going to push gold up. It's going to push assets higher. It's going to push the dollar lower. I mean, it's hard not to look at gold and look at the risk reward scenario right now in gold and GLD as a long term investor. You know, when you're you're thinking all the way out to November, it's a it's a safe play. Um, speaking of Bitcoin, I mean, uh, you know, always the most chaotic, uh, uh, you know, asset out there. I mean, if you look at Bitcoin, it's not doing what gold did. Um, what has Bitcoin been doing? Well, uh, I know you're not able to see a chart on my podcast, so let me kind of walk you through. The big move was from after, you know, a little after BlackRock had the, the Bitcoin ETF. We moved from 40,000 to 70,000, above 70, rather quickly. It, it happened in, a, in, let's call it about two months, you know, less than 60 days. Since then, we've seen a series of lower highs and lower lows. Now, in the grand scheme, you know, when you look at lower highs and lower lows, I mean, that's a, that's a trip down. But if you were to think about things, you know, maybe you go out and you start looking at this in a weekly uh, in a weekly scenario and not in a, a daily scenario. Or maybe you look at long, long, long term. You know, you look at the long term and things look really good. All right. Because if you look at these swing lows, um, I don't want to take you back to 2020, but let's take you back to 2020 for a moment. Bitcoin, 5,000 roughly in 2019 and 2020. You know, we were above 10 for a bit, but we came down to uh, below five during the month of March. And then we ran up to 60 and then we came back down to 30 and we ran up to 65 and then we came back down to 17. And then we ran up to set into 73. And where are we right now on the scale? You know, if you're looking at a, at a five minute chart, um, to me, that's not what you look at with Bitcoin. You don't even, it's, it's even hard to look at the daily chart with Bitcoin. You have to look long term, right? Uh, I believe it's going to be a game changer. I look at it right now, and it, to, as far as I'm concerned, it's in the strong camp. The strong camp is anything above mm, 50,000. And 50,000 was the sticking point. By the way, um, for BTC to be off 30%, to go from the 70s, down to 50,000. That's a 30% trip off the, the highest 70. Seven times three is 21. We went from 70,000 to 49. Right? Did I do that right? 30% off the highs in, in a little over a couple of weeks. And so I couldn't help myself. I had to buy, I had to buy at 60 and then again at 50. And I, and I, I, I got it at 50. It went down to, what was that low last week? I don't know. It was 49 and change. It wasn't there for long, but that's what limit orders do for you. And so I I, I came in at, at 60 and then I, I saw what happened and I thought, I'm going to put some, I'm going to put a little more in at 50. I mean, who says I own BTC for free? <laughs> yeah, I minded 11 years ago. That wasn't free. That cost computer. That cost electricity. <laughs> I wish I'd have mined more. But yeah, I mean, since then, I've been buying. I've been buying and I've been buying and I've been buying. And so, you know, I look at it and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say the same thing that, that I've said before. I, I think, you know, BTC is going to be something where we're going to look back on it. And, you know, we look back on it now and go, wow. You know, when I was mining this thing, guys, it was less than $1,000. It was in the hundreds. And then in 2020, I picked up some at 5,000, 7,500. And I thought I was buying it high then, but I bought in then. And now I'm buying it. I bought some for 71.5, I believe is my highest price I've paid so far. And I look back and I go, wow, that 70, that, that 7,000, that was, that was 10 X ago. And I do believe that in the next five years, I'm probably going to be saying that again. Wow. This, um, this half a million dollar coin, man, I remember when I bought it for 50,000. You know, I think 
that we're going to be saying that too, but it's not going to come without all these big swings because remember, Bitcoin is swinging based on a couple hundred coins of millions and millions being hold, held. A couple hundred coins are, are pushing this thing up and down like they are. All right. Um, last month, I was talking about the junk. Remember the junk? I was talking about the bottom 10% of the quarter. And I want to go back to that for a moment. I want to talk about those five stocks at the bottom. And I was talking about CrowdStrike, PacCar, Fortinet, Lululemon, and Constellation Energy. And I said back in July, this was the worst stuff at the bottom. And we were looking at it two ways. We were like, I don't like selling. I don't like buying junk. Okay, and if the market tells me that something's junk, then maybe I might want to stay away from it. Um, you know, I like to buy stuff when I have a strategy or a system or something that's rules based that's telling me that it could be moving higher. I like to sell stuff when I have a system strategy or rules based trading uh, trade that tells me that something's going lower. So I want to revisit these five stocks that we talked about last month and see where they are, um, you know, just two weeks later. So let's start with CrowdStrike, all right, CRWD. So CrowdStrike, uh, we were talking about this. This stock was trading at $265 two weeks ago. You know where it is now? 239 and that's off of a low of almost 200. So this thing dropped another 20% in the last two weeks before finally gaining some traction. All right, how about PACCAR? That symbol is P-C-A-R. And P-C-A-R, when we talked about it last, was at 94.22. It's at 92.81. It hit 90. So yeah, I mean, it dropped another 5%, but it certainly hasn't turned around. How about Fortinet, F-T-N-T? -T? Well, I got to tell you what, this one jumped. Uh, it was trading at uh, 57.33. That thing's at 60. It's, it's up 10 points from here because it had an earnings report that came out that didn't suck, and it jumped. Okay. Score one for the cheapies. So, so far, there are two that moved in the direction, we, the, in the junk direction, and one came out of junk. How about Lululemon? Lululemon. Lululemon sells $300 pairs of stretchy pants. And I said back then they were, they were selling less. They were selling less $300 stretchy pants than ever before. And the stock was went from $364, and we were looking at it, it as 276 you know where it is today? 240. Even less stretchy pants being sold. All right. Um, three and one, meaning that the junk is three, and one of the junk came out of junk. And the last one I want to talk about is Constellation Energy Group, CEG. CEG was trading at $180 when I was talking to you, and it's $186. So, it has moved a little bit higher off of, but it, you know what? It was down to 155 earlier this week, folks. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to call it, call it three and two. Um, energy, uh, you know, energy is something that, uh, you know, that's a, that's a fickle one because you could look at it and say, well, what is CEG? What do they, what do they extract? If they extract oil, Oil's been moving lower, but if they're extracting something other than oil, I know natural gas has popped up quite a bit since uh, in, in the last couple of weeks. All right. So have I changed any of my preventative measures? Well, let's talk about preventative measures. Remember, I said I like things, not companies, when, when, when uh, the markets are going down. I like metals. I like crypto. Well... I bought, I averaged down into my crypto. I've averaged up into my GLD, and GLD is pretty much exactly where it was. 
a um, couple weeks ago when I was talking about it. It's dropped down. It's dropped back up. Same thing, uh, you know, BTC. So at the end of July, where was where was Bitcoin? Let's get a let's get a fix on that one because I want to make sure I got that. Okay, August or August first, we were at sixty five thousand. August second, we were at uh, literally sixty thousand, and we're almost back to sixty thousand today. So I averaged it at fifty and sixty, and so uh, it has come back, but it's it's down. Okay, it's down, uh, but. You know, I, I believe, like I said, I believe this one's gonna this one's gonna be the really the long term. I am a hodler when it comes to Bitcoin. Michael Saylor, you know, I uh, I, I love this guy, but if you've listened to Michael Saylor, um, you know, this guy has actually it's like a cult following he has. So you gotta listen to him more objectively. Because if you listen to them too hard, you're going to basically take everything you have and throw it into Bitcoin, and you're never going to sleep because of the amount of volatility it draws down. I mean, he is married to Bitcoin. His company is married to Bitcoin. If you listen to him, it's, it's the perfect currency. It's the perfect property. It's digital gold. It's the perfect neighbor that's not picking your pocket. It's an investment advisor that's not charging you. It's the alpha, it's the omega, it's the genesis, it's the exodus, it's the moon and the stars, the sunrise and the sunset. <laughs> it's Jesus, it's Gandhi, it's me, Bitcoin. <laughs> this is, this is what's, what I hear now when I listen to him. But, I mean, obviously this guy is, this guy's putting his money where his mouth is. He really is, and, and that's what I like about him. I like people that put their money where their mouth is. I can't stand analysts. The world has too many of them. He's not an analyst. He is a cheerleader. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's my long term. My medium term hasn't changed. Directional trading, minimum of 30 days. You got to have time to be right if you're an option trader, folks. And you know what? August isn't over yet. There are still bearish opportunities that I'm going to be looking at. In fact, I'm going to be looking at them again next week because we've gotten the poll. We've gotten the, the little relief rally the rest of this week. So what happens next week? Uh, you know, how much higher are we going to go? And are we baking in an interest rate cut now? And I think that's kind of what's going on. So, you know, I, I think you got to be balanced. I think you've got to balance your buys with your sells right now if you're a medium-term trader. And if you're short-term I said it two weeks ago. There's some expensive stuff out there. There's some really expensive stuff out there now. And finally, when I talk about bearishness, there are stocks that go higher as the market goes lower. Here's a few of them that I just pulled off of a defensive scan. Are you ready? Um, Cassava Sciences, S-A-V-A, -A, that has bucked the trend. All right, Cassava Sciences, Sciences is not only at a 52 week, uh, coming off 52 week high, it's coming off a yearly high. This thing hit 40 a couple of days ago, and you can see it's doing the opposite of the market, or at least it has this week. It's gone up when the market's gone down, it's come back a little bit as the market's gone up. Um, now I'm going to get boring with you. T Mobile, <laughs> T Mobile, T Mobile, Tom, why are you talking about T Mobile? Go look at a chart of T-Mobile when you're done listening to me because you can see T-Mobile is hitting new yearly highs, new year-to-date highs, new highs for the last 52 weeks. This thing is, it's, it's not AT&T, that's for sure. It's not Verizon. These guys are making money. And uh, again, T-Mobile US. Uh, you want a tech stock that's not doing what all the other tech stocks are doing? How about Raytheon, RTX? Look at Raytheon. Now, I, granted, a, you know, a couple weeks ago, Raytheon was down at $100. And so, you know, it's up to, what, $115? But Raytheon is, it's near that one-year high. It's near its 52-week high right now, folks. Okay? Now I'm going to give you the three borings. All right? Boring number one, the three M's. 3M, the 3Ms, MMM. 
All right. Just coming off 52 week high. Had a big, big move up off of its earnings as it went from what, the 103 to like 125. And it has not filled that gap. That's bullish. That's a big bullish move for this company, 3M. And then uh, Coca Cola is another one. You know, these stocks, 3M and Coca Cola, they always seem to go up when the markets go down. Really good defensive stocks. If you look at Coke, Coke's been kind of languishing in the low 60s for a big part of the year. Well, it went above 69. Went above 69 since, get this, Coke started moving higher when the S&P started moving lower in mid-July. So if you still believe there's bearishness to be had, then have a Coke and a smile. Yeah, that's an old one. Um, finally, the most boring of the boring, PG, Procter & Gamble. Now, Procter & Gamble have had a, a, a they've, they've seen better days for sure. But have you seen what it's been doing in the last year? I mean, the last year, Procter & Gamble was down, uh, gosh, their low for the year was 100, below 125. They're at 170 right now. They are, uh, you know, they're, they're behind some of the problems they've had. Yeah, they had a bad earnings report that took them from, I think, 170 back down to below 160. And that was uh, at the end of July, but they came roaring right back. And defensive stocks, folks, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, 3M, T-Mobile. I'm giving you the boring ones. These are the boring ones. Now, they don't all sit in the same industry, but they all have one thing in common. They all have year-to-date highs. They all have 52-week highs. Folks, I'm going to end with this. Boring is good during chaos. How do you measure chaos in the market? It's real simple. V-I-X. V-I-X is how you measure chaos. Okay? You look at the VIX. Those option traders can tell you a lot more than anybody else. And the option traders, well, they told you around mid-July. And if they, you didn't listen to them in mid-July, then you needed to listen to them in August. You needed to listen to these folks um, August 2nd when it poked its head above year-to-date highs. And that was down at 18 before it went to 65. And now we're at... We're still sitting around just below 25. So we're not out of the woods yet on this bearishness. I think there's some more bearishness that's going to come. I think it's going to happen here um, for the next month. I think we're going to see bearishness. Uh, your bearishness might. Now, typically, bearishness goes through September. So I think we're going to go into the month of September the same way we have in, what, nine out of the last 10 years down. VIX goes up, Marcus goes down. However, depending on how this uh, election comes out and the nervousness that's happening, you know, isn't it funny every four years, this is the most, this is the, the biggest, most divisive election you're ever going to see. They've been saying that every four years for God, as long as I can remember, but it sure feels different. So we could see a high VIX well into September. We'll see what it looks like as we move on. Hopefully, you're getting something out of my conversations with you. Um, I'll see you next week with some more videos, some more education. All of that's coming. Have a great weekend, folks. Talk to you soon.